start streaming and Hello, this is Robert Jones, and I'm the author of A Brief History of Protestantism in the United States. And in today's live broadcast, the first 30 minutes, I'm going to do uh, a section from that book. It'll be on Protestantism in the 1700s. Then I will turn it over to Elder Ed LeCompte, who will be doing a message on the topic changes. So we started the uh, last month, and uh, we did the introduction to this course. And here you see a list of the topics, and we're really just getting to the 1700s, uh, where we'll talk about the Great Awakening, and we'll talk about the Revolutionary War today. I don't think we'll get to the 1800s, uh, but if we do, we'll, uh, uh, we'll motor on. So just looking at it from the point of view of a timeline, uh, if we look at, in general, the 1700s, we see a split among Baptists into old lights or rationalists and new lights who are more focused on the Holy Spirit and emotionalism. And we could say that this split uh, is also a split that's been in Protestantism all along. Certainly, uh, if you look at Presbyterians or the Frozen Chosen, uh, their worship services are very different than charismatic or uh, uh, Pentecostal services. Uh, and here you have a, that kind of split within a, uh, a particular denomination. Also, we begin to see black Baptist churches uh, start to be formed in the South. 1735 to 1737, we have the Wesley's mission to Georgia. Uh, I called that Methodist, but I should point out that when John and Charles Wesley came to Georgia, they were very much uh, Church of England or Anglican uh, preachers. They had not yet made the jump to Methodist although they had started the, uh, the Methodist clubs in college. So 1706, we see the first American Presbytery at Philadelphia. So uh, you could view this as the start of Presbyterianism in the, the New World. You'll note that it was indeed in Philadelphia, and this will become particularly key as we get into the, um, the Revolutionary War, because indeed the Presbyterians and the Calvinists had a big impact on the war and on the documents uh, produced in our country's founding. 1734, Jonathan Edwards is a key figure in what's called the Great Awakening in the United States. This is really uh, the first uh, uh, great revival in the United States. It will be followed by a number of others. Uh, 1740, Presbyterian Church now splits into New Side Revivalist and Old Side Calvinist. So they're doing the same thing that the Baptists are doing. 1740, also Methodist George Whitfield arrives in America and he goes and hears Jonathan Edwards preach and he says, wow, I'm going to take this message all through the colonies and he uh, starts on a tour, if you will, of the 13 colonies. 1757, the Presbyterians uh, get back together after their split in 1740. 1766, we see the first Methodist societies in the U.S., so that's actually about 30 years after Charles and John Wesley first came here. Uh, one of the reasons for the formation of Methodist societies is John Wesley got to the point where he wanted to start consecrating bishops and priests to send them to the New World. The Anglican Church, church told him, oh, sorry, bub, you're just a priest. Uh, you, you're not allowed to consecrate bishops. And he said, okay, I won't do it as an Anglican. I'll do it as a Methodist. 1769 to 1771, <clears throat> uh, Wesley begins sending lay ministers to the colonies. The most famous by far is known as Francis Asbury. 1769, looking out to the other side of the country, or it wasn't part of the country then, uh, of the continent, uh, Unipero Serra founded the Mission of San Diego de Alcala in San Diego. Eventually, a string of 21 missions would be established in California. The last was built in 1823. These, of course, were Roman Catholic. I understand that Roman Catholic Church is not Protestant, 
uh, but it was a key thing to have happen on the continent in terms of Christianity. 1770, Mother uh, Ann Lee, who lives from 1736 to 1784, has a revelation that sex is the root of all human evil. Celibacy becomes the foundation of the Shakers. And the Shakers actually last for a little over 100 years. Uh, eventually, they discover that if you don't allow sex, you don't have any progeny, and well, then you die out eventually. 1775 to 1783, disarray in the American version of the Church of England as a uh, Revolutionary War exposes divided loyalties. So this is kind of where you start to see the Anglican Church or the Church of England split into two. You have the Episcopals and you have the Anglicans. Uh, 1776 to 1779, many Methodist preachers and congregants loyal to England flee to Canada or England. 1776 to 1783, 30 Presbyterian ministers enroll in the Continental Army as chaplains. Uh, so you can see uh, where the Continental Army is getting their uh, spiritual advice from are uh, Calvinist Presbyterians. 1776, three Catholics signed the Declaration of Independence and later the Constitution. Their names are Thomas Fitzsimmons, Charles Carroll, and Daniel Carroll. We should point out that everyone else was a Protestant or at least uh, a deist if they were not a Protestant. 1776, uh, Reverend John Witherspoon, a Presbyterian minister, signs the Declaration of Independence. 1783, a conference of churches in Maryland adopts the name Protestant Episcopal Church. Uh, so now we see the codifying of the split in the Church of England. 1784, a Christmas conference in Baltimore organizes the Methodist Episcopal Church and appoints its first bishops, Francis Asbury and Thomas Koch. And interestingly enough, we still have the meetings from that conference. Uh, and uh, I think in the book, I, I uh, had the, uh, the moment where Asbury is actually made the first official bishop. 1789, the first meeting of the House of Bishops, church constitution is adopted in Philadelphia. Here's where we have the formal split from the Church of England and the Episcopals are uh, now with us. 1789, the first General Assembly in uh, the New World, the Presbyterians. 1792, the first General Conference of the Methodist is held. 1793, 73,471 73, Baptists in the United States. About a quarter of them are black. And I should mention that the bulk of those Baptists are in the Northeast at this point. We're not, uh, there's no Southern Baptist Convention yet or anything like that. So let's drill down on a couple of those topics. The first one will be the Great Awakening, which, as I said, uh, is the beginning of the revival movement in uh, the United States. And it happens in 1734. There's a uh, Congregationalist preacher named Jonathan Edwards who is very, very Calvinist. Matter of fact, I would say John Edwards was more Calvinist than Calvin was. I think if there was a competition between the two of them, Jonathan Edwards would win. So he's a very strict Calvinist preacher. He's preaching at a little church in Northampton, Massachusetts, out in the middle of nowhere at the time. Uh, and th th this work that he did in this church where eventually he preached five sermons and said that he uh, saved 300 people. In time, this great awakening would impact not just all of New England, but in the 1740s, all of America. Now, when we think of revivals today, we sometimes think of the camp revivals of the Methodist, or we think of uh, revivals in the Baptist church. Uh, but the revival under Jonathan Edwards, who remember was a very strict Calvinist, it was not like those uh, uh, big outdoor revivals in the 19th and 20th century. The church house, not the camp meeting, not the stadium, uh, was the center of the revival. There was none of the ecstatic fervor that you saw in some of the later revivals. There weren't people uh, falling on the ground and rolling around, or you, you didn't have people lifting their arms during the, the service. I think Jonathan Edwards would have bowled over from a stroke and died if anyone had, had lifted their arms during one of his services. He was a Christian rationalist, a Calvinist rationalist, so he, he would have been opposed to any kinds of excesses. So the beginning of the Great Awakening is characterized by people, one, reflecting on their own sinful life, two, wanting to get right with God, 
seeking out others to talk about God, and focusing on matters of church and faith on an everyday basis. Jonathan Edwards later wrote a book about the beginning of the Great Awakening. Uh, it was called A Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Work of God. He talks about the work in this town and others about us has been extraordinary on account of the uh, universality of it all, affecting all sorts, sober and vicious, high and low, rich and poor, wise and unwise. This dispensation has also appeared very extraordinary in the numbers of those on whom we have reason to hope it has had a saving effect. We have about 620 communicants, which include almost all our adult persons. The church was very large before, but persons never thronged into it as they did in the uh, late uh, extraordinary time. Our uh, sacraments are eight weeks asunder, and I received into our communion about 100 before one sacrament, four score of them at one time, whose appearance when they presented themselves together to make an open, explicit profession of Christianity was very effective to the congregation. So here's a guy running a little church, and suddenly he's got 100 people lined up on a Sunday uh, wanting to be accepted into the church. He goes on to say that I am far from pretending to be able to determine how many have lately been the subjects of such mercy, but if I may be allowed to declare anything that appears to me probable and a thing of thin nature, I hope that more than 300 souls were savingly brought home to Christ in this town in the space of half a year and about the same number of males as females. So he's very precise with his numbers. Uh, he has a lot of humility. He's not claiming that he started a great revival that changed America. He's just saying, in my church, I think 300 people uh, were saved. He goes on to say, these awakenings, when they have first seized on persons, have had two effects. One was that they have brought them immediately to quit their sinful practices. The looser sort have been brought to forsake and dread their former vices and extravagances. When once the Spirit of God began to be so wonderfully poured out in a general way through the town, people had soon done with their old quarrels, backbitings, and intermeddling with other men's matters. The tavern was soon left empty, and persons kept very much at home. None went abroad unless on necessary business or on some religious account, and every day seemed in many respects like a Sabbath day. The other effect was that it put them on earnest application to the means of salvation, reading, prayer, meditation, the ordinances of God's house, and private conference. Their cry was, what shall we do to be saved? The place of resort was now ordered. It was no longer the tavern, but the minister's house that was thronged far more than ever the tavern had been wont to be. Uh, this is not something I see happening today. Uh, so perhaps we need another uh, great awakening. A little later, after these five sermons that he talked about that saved 300 people, uh, he writes what is perhaps the most famous sermon in the history of the United States, at least the most famous sermon by a Protestant. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It's his most famous sermon. It's a faithful representation of basic Calvinist principles. Had I mentioned that Jonathan Edwards was indeed a Calvinist. And as I said, he wrote it after uh, the start of the Great Awakening. Now to us today, even among hardcore Calvinists, this is a very tough sermon, I think. Uh, and I, I'll do a couple passages here that should give you an idea. Uh, there is no one of power in God to cast wicked men into hell at any moment. They deserve to be cast into hell so that divine justice never stands in the way. It makes no objection against God's using his power at any moment to destroy them. Yea, on contrary, justice calls aloud for an infinite punishment of their sins. They are already under a sentence of condemnation to hell. They are now the objects of that very same anger and wrath of God that is expressed in the torments of hell. And the reason why they do not go down to hell at each moment is not because God, in whose power they are, is not then very angry with them, as he is with many miserable creatures now tormented in hell, who there feel and bear the fierceness of wrath. Yea, God is a great deal more angry with great numbers that are now on earth, yea, doubtless with many that are now in this congregation, who it may be are at ease than he is with many of those who are now in the flames of hell. Continuing, the devil stands ready to fall upon them and seize them as his own. At what moment God shall permit him, they belong to him. He has their souls in his possession and under his dominion. I was in a uh, Presbyterian church, a Sunday school class one time, about uh, 20 years ago. And 
the choir director of that particular church, she had come from a Baptist background. And we were talking about, you know, how are you saved and that sort of thing. And she suddenly announced to a shocked room that we are all children of Lucifer. And even though this was a Presbyterian church, there were gasps. <laughs> there were gasps in the room. We had to bring in a defibrillator and <laughs> oxygen and people were just stunned. And this is a room full of Presbyterians. But this would be Calvinist doctrine. The devil stands ready to fall upon him and seize him as his own. At what moment God shall permit him. They belong to him. He has their souls in his possession and under his dominion. There are in the souls of wicked men and these hellish principles reigning that would present kindle and flame out into hellfire if it were not for God's restraints. God has laid himself under no obligation by any promise to keep any natural man out of hell. One moment. Another time, I don't want to give you the impression that, that no one would agree with this sermon today. Uh, another time I was, uh, I, I was dressed like Jonathan Edwards. I had, you know, the black flat brim cap. Uh, I had the, the black suit on, et cetera, et cetera. And I did this whole sermon. Uh, also, it was at a Presbyterian church. And I did it from beginning to end. And there's a point in the sermon where Jonathan Edwards says, and for you young people. And there was a guy in the audience who was the head of the high school, Sunday school. And I saw him turn around and point several times to the high schoolers like, you better listen to this. <laughs> so I don't want to give you the impression that uh, no one would agree uh, with Jonathan Edwards' sermon. So we move on to George Whitfield. The Great Awakening becomes a national sensation, not because of Jonathan Edwards. We didn't have Facebook Live back then. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have text messaging. Uh, so the fact that this guy preaches five sermons in a little dinky town in the middle of nowhere, that is not what touched off the Great Awakening. What touched it off is George Whitfield who, by the way, is cronies with uh, uh, John and Charles Wesley. He was in the Methodist club in England. He hears Edwards preach, and he is so blown away. He wants to take the message to the colonies. Uh, Whitfield is sometimes referred to as a uh, Methodist Calvinist preacher, which uh, I can assure you today is something which no longer exists. Uh, Methodists are not Calvinists. Anyway, uh, according to Christian History Magazine, about 80% of all American colonists heard him speak at least once. This is Beyonce numbers. This is, this, is, uh, this is amazing that in the 1700s, 80% of the population of the 13 colonies heard George Whitfield. In his lifetime, Whitfield preached 18,000 times. He addressed perhaps 10 million hearers. And by the way, how does that go with the 80%? Well, at the time, the population of the colonies is probably 12 to 13 million. Whitfield's born in England. 1729, he co-founds the Holy Club at Oxford with John and Charles Wesley. Now, I've always described the Holy Club as sort of a uh, uh, lay monastic order. Uh, they were dedicated to the study of the scriptures, so it was a Bible study. They adopted a strict moral code, encouraged periodic fasting, and had a thriving prison ministry. Uh, so this is the beginning of the Methodist. And a matter of fact, the term Methodist is first applied to this club, and it was not meant to be uh, a nice thing. Uh, somebody called them Methodist because he thought they were too legalistic, so he called them Methodist. And Charles Wesley heard it and he said, wow, what a great <laughs> idea. We're Methodists. 1739, he becomes an ordained priest in the Anglican Church, However, he was not welcome to preach in many churches because of his message. So, when he wasn't allowed inside the churches, guess what he started to do? He starts preaching outside instead. He starts preaching to people while they're on their way to work. He starts preaching, preaching in prisons. He starts preaching in fields on Sundays. And uh, tens of thousands of people come to hear him preach. 1739 to 1740, like the Beatles in 1964, he begins his first tour in America. Uh, he preaches first at Jonathan Edwards Church in Northampton, uh, and, and then he makes a tour around the 13 colonies. And for those of you are, who are in Georgia who are watching this, he founds an orphanage in Georgia. 
and Georgia serves as his home base during his visits to America. So while Jonathan Edwards may be considered to be the theological father of the Great Awakening, George Whitfield is its greatest celebrity. Okay, we promise we'll talk about John and Charles Wesley visiting America. I had a guy in my Sunday school class one time said that he's from Georgia, and he said uh, he'd always been brought up with the idea that the Wesleys must have been decades in America, and he was shocked when he saw that they were here from 1735 to 1737. And as a matter of fact, Charles Wesley was only here like nine months. He hated it so much he, he went home. Uh, so they weren't here that long. They were the only European founders of a denomination to visit America. So Luther never came to America. It hadn't been, uh, well, I guess it had been discovered by that point. If you view Columbus as the discovery of America. But he never come. Zwingli had never come. Uh, George Smythe had never come. Calvin had never come, etc. Um, they did mission work with the Indians. John got a crush on a woman called Sophie Hopke, uh, and he beat around the bush so much about asking her to marry him that she finally married somebody else, and poor John refused communion to her because he was jealous that she had married somebody else, and the bad news for John is her father happened to be the magistrate of Savannah, and so a whole bunch of charges, I sh which I should recount are totally spurious, were brought against Wesley. He finally gets out of town, and he later said, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who will convert me? And if anybody out there, maybe there's some Methodists out there that think, well, where do you get all this information? How do you know about all this stuff with Sophie Hopke and the magistrate and all that stuff? That just sounds like propaganda against John Wesley. The reason we know about it is because he recorded it in his diary, and you can find that diary on on probably uh, a thousand web pages today. Uh, here's just a couple pictures. There's a Wesley Memorial. Uh, if you go to Fort Pulaski, Georgia, um, walk down into the swamp that's uh, behind the fort uh, and you will find this wonderful little memorial there. Uh, so we do get to the Revolutionary War and the ideology of the American Revolution is a curious mixture. It's a mixture of Calvinism on the one hand and Enlightenment humanism on the other. And this kind of gets into that question uh, Obama said, we're not a Christian nation or we're not a Christian nation anymore. But were we a Christian nation when, uh, when uh, the country was founded? So we'll talk a little about that in this uh, section because there's, there are some differences between Calvinism and uh, Enlightenment humanism. So just a few things about Calvinist thought. The church and state are responsible to God. They don't rule over each other. Divine natural law should be the foundation for all secular government. God establishes states to enforce divine laws. Interestingly enough, uh, Calvin thought that democratically elected rulers are most likely to rule justly. So uh, the beginning of modern democracies yeah, yeah, I know Athens and 10 billion years ago, I get all that. But the foundation of modern um, democracy is actually John Calvin. And when he created the Reformed Church, the Presbyterian Church, that's why the elders ran the church and the elders voted on who the pastor was. Uh, he believed that the populace should obey the law unless commanded to do what is contrary to God's law. Guess what that doesn't mix real well with? Uh, the divine right of kings. The divine right of kings, they felt, well, I'm the king. God made me the king. Therefore, anything I want or anything I want to do is right. And Calvin said, uh-uh. Nope. Not if you tell people to do things that are contrary to God's law. So uh, unjust rulers or dictators could uh, be removed by the populace. That's a pretty shocking thought for the time. Now we have Enlightenment thought. Many of our nation's fathers, such as Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, they're probably really deists as opposed to card-carrying Christians. They kind of believe there was a God out there someplace. They didn't necessarily think it was uh, uh, Jesus of the New Testament. You'll notice in our foundational uh, doctrine or yeah, foundational documents, I'll get it out. There's a lack of references to Christ or Jesus. 
Um, we see phrases such as creator of the universe, providence, nature's God. There's no question they were all monotheistic. There's no question they all believed in a God. They weren't necessarily all uh, Christian, although most of them were. Their ideological influences were Enlightenment figures such as John Locke and Voltaire. Voltaire, I think we could say, was not really a, a friend of uh, the Christian religious movement. Foundational documents of the revolution, such as the Declaration of Independence, common sense are replete with references to God. So, Declaration of Independence, one in the course of human events becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separate. Uh, it goes on talks about they're endowed by who? They're endowed by their creator. They're not endowed by the government. They're endowed by their creator. <laughs> Monotheistic, not creators, not a whole bunch of them dancing around Greek gods or something. They're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, talks in appealing to the supreme judge of the world. Well, that's not uh, the European Union. That's not the International Criminal Court. That's God, the supreme judge of the world, for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, again, not the European Union, not the International Criminal Court, uh, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Monotheistic belief in a creator God. Common sense, Thomas Paine. Uh, the whole thing, he invokes the Old Testament as a proof that kings have no moral basis. Views that the distance between England and America and the fact that America was discovered before the Reformation was divinely guided. So American exceptionalism was with us for, from the beginning. It wasn't just gunboat diplomacy under Theodore Roosevelt or even under the Monroe document. It was there from the beginning. He viewed that the colony should recognize only one king. He reigns above and does not make havoc of mankind like the royal brute of England. Uh, <laughs> In case you don't realize he's referring to the king of England. Yeah. <laughs> Government by kings was first introduced in the world by the heathens, from whom the children of Israel copied a custom. It was the most prosperous invention the devil ever set on foot for the promo uh, promotion of idolatry. As exalting one man so greatly above the rest cannot be justified on the equal rights of nature, so neither can it be defended on the authority of Scripture. For the will of the Almighty, as declared by Gideon and the prophet Samuel, expressly disapproves of government by kings. So here are uh, very explicit references to the Old Testament to prove his point. Again, common sense, even the distance at which the Almighty have placed England and America is a strong and natural proof that the authority of the one over the other was never the design of heaven. He talks about the Reformation was preceded by the discovery of America, as if the Almighty graciously meant to open a sanctuary to the persecuted in future years when home should afford neither friendship nor safety. But where says some is the king of America? I'll tell you, friend, he reigns above and doth not make havoc of mankind like the royal brute of Britain. Again, uh, the, uh, the king of America is not the United Nations. It's not the European Union. It's not the International Criminal Court. It's not the United States Congress, and it's not executive orders from the president. It's uh, he who reigns above. And I think we'll cut it off there because it'll take us a second to switch over to Ed, who has a message today on changes. But when we pick up uh, next time, which will be, this is June, right? So we'll do one in July. When we pick up there, we'll pick up with Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. And then we'll look a bit at the Revolutionary War itself. So Ed is moving toward the dais. And he will be here in a moment to do his message. And I am getting up now. <laughs> and Ed will soon be replacing me here in the hot seat. We will swap.
we will get the technology sorted out, hopefully. <coughs> I will join you again this morning. Just a moment. Ah, surprise, surprise. Thank you to my friends at Microsoft. Things seem to be working. And we can go ahead and get started. Just a quick comment on, uh, on uh, Robert's class there. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie, The Madness of uh, King George. Originally, it was titled The Madness of George III, but they were afraid for the American audience they would feel that they had missed the first two episodes of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the series, so they changed the title to The Madness of King George. Okay, welcome back. Uh, our most heartfelt uh, welcome here this uh, beautiful Pentecost Sunday uh, morning. God has made this day. Uh, let us rejoice in it. Uh, and he has chosen it to uh, share this day with us. It is by his providence that we awaken this day, uh, his sovereignty, that we may draw breath into our lungs. Uh, and as the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, let us do so uh, now together. Amen. Let us open with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, it is by your providence that we awaken and draw breath today. And it is by your grace and your grace alone that we are called to seek you and only you through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. We may be saved and given the opportunity to worship, praise, and glorify you forever. All that we have is from you. All that we need is provided by you. Your beauty and majesty shines all around us. Your wondrous works astound us, and we are humbled. Be with us today, enlighten and invigorate us with your spirit. Make the pages of your word come alive to us and awaken us from our mortal stupor. For we have all sinned and fallen short of your glory like selfish children. We continue to press our own way when you have provided the one and true way through your most holy and honored son, our living Lord and Savior Jesus, through whom we most humbly pray. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today comes from the book of Genesis, uh, about as far back as you can go in the Old Testament. Uh, Genesis chapter 17, verses 7 through 8. Uh, please feel free to follow along with me. My Bible is right here. Hopefully yours is handy too. Um, don't take my word for it. Don't take your preacher's word for it. Don't take that guy on late night television's word for it. Open your Bible, read, follow along with me if you can. Uh, validate the things that I tell you. Um, dear Heavenly Father, as you have given us ears to hear, open our ears, hearts, and minds now to the reading of your most holy word. Amen. Genesis 17, verses 7 through 8. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojourns, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And let's turn ahead now uh, to the New Testament. The book of Acts, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 6 and 12 through 13, the coming of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in their own language. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. So ends our reading this morning. And of course, at this point, uh, Peter, the, uh, the disciple Peter, now the apostle Peter, who had failed spectacularly in his mission, uh, who when called upon to stand up for Jesus in his final hours, denied him three times, stands up and preaches 
uh, the first and probably one of the greatest, maybe right after or up there with uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, the greatest sermons of the Christian faith, the power of the Holy Spirit at work with him. Amen. Change. There are few more terrifying words in the English language. So terrifying is change that I have actually been trained by my employer on how to teach something called change management or how to handle and manage change. Change in the workplace is typically met with a common response, panic. If you're like most people, the first act someone uh, whose workplace is changing does is to, after you talk them down off the ledge, uh, is to update their resume. What about change in a family? Looking at myself, a couple of hundred years ago when I was a, a, a child, I was a son, then I was an adolescent and not a pleasant one at that, uh, then a college graduate, a newlywed, a new father, uh, and now very nearly an empty nester. There have been important influences and people uh, in my life who have come and gone, and uh, someday I shall go to uh, change. Why do you, uh, what change do you suppose overcame the apostles as they waited there in Jerusalem? Well, let's see uh, what Jesus says in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, they're speaking of Jesus, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised you, uh, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So what did the apostles do? They sat around and dutifully waited? No! They ran off and cast lots to determine who was going to replace Judas as the 12th apostle, Matthias or Barsabas, to decide um, uh, who, who would be the 12th disciple or the 12th apostle. Uh, incidentally, if you're curious, Matthias won. Uh, but of course, this is the last time we hear of him in the New Testament. Coincidence? Maybe. Well, how long was it that Jesus had actually asked them to wait? I'd like to do the math. Let's see. Jesus died on the day of, Pentecost, uh, of Passover. Excuse me. He was resurrected three days later and appeared to his disciples over a period of 40 days, which included the day he was resurrected. So he ascended to heaven 42 days after Passover. Pentecost means the 50th day, uh, and it was the 50th day of the Passover, or the 49th day after Passover. Therefore, it was only seven days between the ascension of, and, uh, uh, between the ascension of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit. One whole week, they couldn't sit still and wait. This, of course, is a good example of modern man's inability uh, to remain patient uh, for the making good of the gospel. Uh, but we can chat about that a little later. That's probably even a, a whole another uh, message uh, title. But. So how would you like to be doing a change management class for the disciples? You get them in the room. Uh, the first thing you tell them is, well, I'm sorry, you're no longer disciples. You are now apostles. So you're going to have to get rid of all the old letterhead, uh, all the old stationery. We're changing the name. Uh, we need you to be patient. A major change is coming. Uh, but we're not exactly sure how and when. Uh, and, oh, all those Romans outside, uh, the guys that have been trying to wipe you off the, the face of the earth, um, well, the power of God is going to come upon you. And instead of hiding like you've been doing with the doors barricaded and the windows blocked up, oh, you're going to go out among them uh, and preach the good news of Jesus uh, and his resurrection and the redemption of all our sins. And the best part is, you know this guy, Peter? Uh, Peter over here, uh, Peter, just go ahead and stand up. Uh, the one who denied Jesus three times, uh, well, he's going to be the one who goes out and preaches to the crowd of both Jews and Gentiles, and is going to convert 3,000 people uh, to your group on the first day. There are going to be 3,000 new followers of Jesus. That's right, you heard me, it's going to be Peter. Uh, okay, now, Matthias, uh, would you do me a favor? Would you hand me that flip chart? Uh, we'll bring the dry erase markers over here. We can go ahead and get started. So uh, you can imagine doing that, that change management for that group. So we have Peter. Peter, who often asked the wrong question, was rebuked by Jesus, who became afraid while walking to Jesus on the water, began to sink and had to be rescued. 
Peter, who fell asleep at Gethsemane and who denied Jesus three times. Peter was not the perfect disciple. Yet Peter stood up that day and 3,000 were added to their number. Was this the same Peter? Was this the fisherman from Galilee? Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit as a helper. In John 16, uh, verse 7, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And in John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the Word cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So how do we typically think of the Holy Spirit? Uh, when was the last time you heard the Holy Spirit preached in your church? Uh, do we think of him as kind of a Casper the Friendly Ghost type, uh, the part of the Trinity that comes along and makes you feel good and does stuff for you? Uh, it's crucial to note that the Holy Spirit is an actual, unique person, a full third of the Trinity, and not merely a, a, a feeling or a power, uh, but a person of the Trinity who is always working in conjunction with the Father and the Son. And just as the Holy Spirit was present and active in creation, as we see in Genesis chapter 1, 1 through 2, uh, he is present and active now in the new creation, uh, the new creation under the new covenant of Jesus Christ. And the Spirit is the author of the scriptures. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 tells us that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, uh, for, reproof for correction, and for training in righteousness. In Genesis, the Hebrew word for spirit, and excuse my butchering of the language, is uh, ruach, which also translates as breath. So the ruach Elohim, or the breath of God. In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 16, the Greek word is theonoustos. Theonoustos, excuse me, uh, I'll butcher, I took French, I didn't take Greek. Uh, theonoustos, which means God breathed. So we see the work of the Holy Spirit in the breath of God, bringing forth the power of God uh, in his creation, uh, in his redemption, and in the transferring of God's holy word into the written form for us. Peter, of course, makes this point uh, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, where he says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Jesus described the helper as the one who would come alongside. Again, uh, as we stated back uh, uh, in John 14, uh, Jesus said, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit is with you forever. He dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit is both personal and permanent. As the Holy Spirit came down on the apostles that day, the Holy Spirit is active in our lives today. The Holy Spirit is the active part of our regeneration or our being born again. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no regeneration. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus states, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So what does that mean to be born again? Is, it the, whole, is the Holy Spirit not active in our lives if we haven't had that Damascus uh, road experience? And I'm referring, of course, to, to Saul's conversion to Paul as he's walking down the, uh, the road to Damascus, the blinding light, and, and Jesus confronting him at that time. Uh, not all of us may have that Damascus, uh, Damascus Road experience. In John chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus states, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on that day. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him.
In Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, Paul quotes the Psalms and Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes when he writes, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who, do, who does good, not even one. There is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who seeks God. No one can come to Jesus unless God has first ordained it. it may sound a little bit like predestination. Oh, there he goes again, talking about Calvin and his predestination. You know, Calvin, of course, who agreed with Luther, who agreed with Augustine, who agreed with the Apostle Paul, who agreed with, well, Jesus uh, on predestination. So we cannot come to Jesus unless it is ordained by God the Father. No one seeks God. In our basic human nature, we rebel against God, we deny him, we resent his rules and demands on our lives. As Americans, we resent the lordship of God and reject his purpose for our lives. Uh, no one seeks God, not even one. So then, why do we seek God? I never had the Damascus Road experience. The closest I had was the Shelter Island experience on Long Island once uh, during a church youth group uh, out in Shelter Island between the forks, if you're familiar with the area. Uh, but quite frankly, I was a believer beforehand and I was still a believer afterwards. Uh, it was possibly one experience I had in my life where I could feel the Holy Spirit working in my, in my, uh, in my life, but uh, just one of the times I felt the, uh, the Spirit working through me. My faith has grown substantially over the years. My eagerness to learn uh, and my thirst for both biblical and theological uh, knowledge has increased significantly over the past years uh, and is growing at a faster rate now than at any time within my lifetime. Am I saved? Are you? If no one comes to Jesus but through the Father and by nature no one seeks God, then it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit working with us and along us and through us that we reach out to God and we are drawn to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is alive and with us. This is God's breath breathing everlasting life into us that we may understand and come to Jesus. John chapter 6 verses 30, uh, 35 through 40. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and you still do not believe. All those that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall not lose one of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day, for my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on that last day. Again, I'm fortunate, uh, though I've never, or at least not yet, had that Damascus Road experience, uh, I have had the Holy Spirit with me. He helps me, he works with me, he guides me, and when I go against his plan for me, uh, things do not work out. Uh, if there's a preacher out there who's preaching out of their own experiences, their own theories or philosophies, uh, or their own interpretation of the scriptures, beware. If the preaching of the word that you're hearing is their word and not the spirit acting through the scriptures, you are in dangerous territory. And I've seen the hopelessness that abounds within the soul of a person who does not walk with the spirit. Imagine the hopelessness of this world without the grace of God, without the Holy Spirit working with us, without the promise of Jesus, without the help of the Holy Spirit, a long, bleak, weary walk into eternity. eternity. We will try to fill the void with the latest gadget, whatever is on television, trips, material things, uh, things that can never fill the God-shaped hole in our lives. As Pascal wrote in the 17th century, see if this sounds familiar, what else does the craving 
and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace this he tries to fill uh, this he tries in vain to fill with everything around him seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are though none can help since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object in other words by god himself end quote god calls us we accept the calling and reach out to jesus as our savior with regeneration coming through the work of the holy spirit do we still live in sin yes if you said no please refer to your notes from the last time we met uh, i'm glad you're a nice person i'm glad you told the woman you work with that her hair looked nice when it looked like a squirrel's nest uh, I'm glad that you try not to lie if it's going to hurt someone, unless it's going to hurt someone's feelings. I'm glad you didn't take the last donut. I'm glad you put the 34 cents in the, uh, in the Jerry's Kids can at the cash register after you paid $5 for your, for your coffee. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that you do these good things. I'm glad that you're a good person. You're still a sinner. You still need a savior. But we all are. Every last stinking one of us. We've been called, we've reached out to Jesus, but we have turned our lives, have we turned our lives over to the Holy Spirit? I ask myself this regularly and I'm afraid the answer is no. I still get in the way of myself. As any good father would want their child to act in a certain way and live uh, a godly life, how much more does our Heavenly Father want the same for us? And so much more. God's patience is astounding. By his grace and his grace alone, we are still here. God does not want to lose a single one of us. And as such, he keeps the world turning and keeps calling to us long past the patience we humans can uh, practice and far beyond what we humans deserve. To that end, on our own, it's hopeless. In God, however, all things are possible. God sends us the Holy Spirit and wants us to change from within to be more Christ-like. On our own, again, this is impossible. With the Holy Spirit working within us, controlling our minds and our wills, all things are possible. Without the Holy Spirit acting in me and through me, I can achieve nothing toward the glory of God. I have the Holy Spirit's greatest tool, the Bible. The inerrant word of God as a guide. I have the faith God has planted in me uh, and the knowledge that I need to pray constantly for the Holy Spirit to act in my life. And all of this, I have hope. And hope is what we need to share. With that coworker, with that neighbor, with that family member uh, who has lost hope or has never had hope, has no hope at all, we need to encourage to share with them the good news. We need the courage to share with them the good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And it can be as simple as sharing with someone uh, who is a non-believer as to go to God in prayer, to pray with them, to pray for them, to show them how to go to God and ask for what they need, to ask for the Holy Spirit to come into their lives and to ask for the Holy Spirit to change them and to turn them into Christ. So there's that word change again. Will life be easy when you become a Christian? Mm, no. Will people stop teasing you, stop ostracizing you, avoiding you when you become a Christian? Mm, no. Uh, will people be thrilled to hear your message when you become a Christian? They'll have you over at parties to share your experience? Uh, no. Uh, will you know the peace of God and better understand your role in the human race when you become a Christian? Yes. Our society is backsliding into a multicultural, polytheistic, pluralistic, jumbled mess of anything goes. Mainline denominations have turned away from the scriptures and have adopted a social gospel of loving and accepting your fellow man as a basic tenet of Christianity and are rapidly dissolving as a result. The society they're trying to placate uh, is becoming increasingly hostile to Christianity and will not be happy until Christian doctrine is watered down to the point where it is not offensive to anyone and is no longer gospel truth. Freedom of religion in America, one of its greatest attributes, Robert spoke of it uh, earlier today, uh, is degrading into freedom from religion. 
and Christianity will be tolerated as long as it remains behind closed doors of sparsely attended churches on Sunday mornings. Ironic that a concept that came out of uh, Protestantism, freedom of religion, will eventually fade away with the blessing of the very denominations that invented it. When proclaiming that God created heaven, earth and mankind, all of mankind becomes hate speech and is banned. When proclaiming the exclusivity of Christ becomes hate speech and is banned. When proclaiming that Jesus Christ is God's one and only son becomes hate speech and is banned. When proclaiming that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ and by faith alone becomes hate speech and is banned. When the United States reverts to a pre-Reformation state, when the freedom of a religion truly becomes freedom from religion, when the government in an, its effort to regulate hate speech becomes like the Roman Catholic Church of Luther's time, where we can brought up, be brought up on charges for speaking God's truth, where will Louisville be? Where will Minneapolis be? Where will Nashville be? And I only pick on the Methodists this morning because, well, I suppose I can. Uh, but on the Methodist website, will they be proclaiming the truth of God's word and the truth of the gospel and the necessity of the saving grace of Jesus Christ rather than uh, the current call for climate justice? Can we change it? Societal change is a very slow process, and evangelical Christians typically would like to see quick change. But true gospel change takes time. God is patient, and so should we be. We need to focus on prayer, basic doctrinal teaching, and investing in our children to produce Christians who are well-grounded in the basic tenets of our faith. My son is 21, and we're beginning to review the Westminster Catechism, question by question. We starting today. Satan loves tomorrow. Start today. When God touches our lives, uh, and when we turn our lives over to the Holy Spirit, nothing is the same. As change hit the apostles in Jerusalem close to 2,000 years ago, may God bless us with his Spirit here today. As the Holy Spirit worked through Peter, may he work through us today. May God draw us to Christ and lead us to hope. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, not one of us searches for you unless called by you. Not one of us is drawn to Jesus except by you. Not one of us is regenerated except by the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the blessing of your Holy Spirit, we pray, that he works in ourselves and in our lives, helping us, guiding us, teaching us, and making us more Christ-like in all that we do. In Jesus' most holy name, we humbly pray. Amen. On behalf of Robert Jones and myself, Ed LeCompte, We'd like to thank you for joining us here this week and pray that the peace of God the Father, the love of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all believers now and always. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone. We'll be doing this again uh, in July. We haven't decided on the, uh, the date yet, but until that time, take care. I finished before me.